John, one of the last living disciples that walked with Jesus, was living in exile on an island called Patmos. One day God gave him a vision, commanding him to write letters to seven different churches. John also saw a series of mysterious and symbolic scenes. He saw a door open into heaven, and he was swept up into it. He saw a throne with someone sitting on it. In front of the throne, he saw a lamb looking as if it had been killed. Lightning flashed from the throne and thunder clapped. People and creatures surrounding the throne all fell down and worshipped the lamb. And thousands of angels circled the throne and said in a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Every creature in heaven and on earth gave praise to the Lamb and to the one seated on the throne. Next, John saw every person who ever lived standing in front of the throne. A book called the Book of Life opened up. Anyone whose name was not in the Book of Life was thrown into a lake of fire. But for all those whose names were there, something amazing awaited. John saw a bright and shining city descend from the sky. A loud voice told him this was where all of God's people will live and that God will live there among them forever. God will wipe away every tear and there will be no more death, crying or pain. A river as clear as crystal flowed from the throne of God through the middle of this great city. Next to the river stood the tree of life, which healed the world from every wrong, making all things perfect. Then Jesus himself, standing with John, said, Come, let those who are thirsty come. Let all who wish take a free gift of the water of life. And it is a privilege to extend that invitation from the dry marker board and the screen to you this morning. If you are thirsty, if the philosophies of the world have come up empty, uh, if the gratification of the flesh has left you wanting true life and true joy, uh, if the power of the world has disappointed, uh, if the relational uh, points of reference in your life have given way you have been extended are being extended will be extended to you this great invitation come drink of the water of life freely and live with a capital L so this morning it is my privilege and joy to present to you one final installment of this series we've called the story uh, chapter 31, the end of time as we know it. On slide number three, there are page references there for you. If you've tracked along with us in the book uh, called The Story. Uh, and I, I absolutely love finishing things, don't you? It's a joy. I haven't been running long, but I have discovered I love coming to the finish line. All hot and sweaty and bringing that baby home with authority. That's a joy. If I'm still alive and breathing and able to do it, it's fun to come home, isn't it? And so that's what this is about is bringing this baby home with authority and power. And that's exactly what uh, the, the Bible does for us. And that's what John the Revelator does for us in the book of Revelation. He brings it home to a strong finish. And so today... We're going to look at that, um, we're going to spark the imagination a little bit, and we're going to see a very powerful passage. Um, we have one time did a whole series on the book of Revelation, and so um, some of you may, may recognize some of the themes that I talk about this morning from that series, but for those who were not through that series, it's okay, you just have to trust my summaries, uh, summaries and summarizations of some of the book of Revelation this morning in order to get what I, uh, to what I need to say, uh, talk to you about this morning. So, uh, how will the world end? That's the big question, isn't it? There are many false narratives 
And in, in this series, we have looked at the story, the true story that's been operative from the beginning of time, meandering its way down through human history, through families, through nations, uh, through prophets, and sage, and priests, all the way down through time. We have this story that's kind of found its way through the free will human decisions of people. And all the while, God, the great self-discloser, is revealing something of himself as this story unfolds. It's a fascinating story. And the question that we get to is how will the world end? And there are many false narratives that try to explain life, where we came from, where we're headed, what went wrong in the world, what God's doing to fix it. Is there life after death? Does suffering get resolved eventually? Lots of false narratives that try to answer that those questions. But you see the Bible... Uh, others may worry about nuclear conflagration. Uh, some even fret over the possible extraterrestrial invasions. Some uh, feel like that maybe uh, disease or pollution is going to be the extinction of the human race. But according to a biblical worldview, none of these possible explanations, these false narratives, are adequate to explain what God is going to do the day or the time in which time will be no more as we know it and the great curtain of human history will fall. And then it will part and we will be into another age. The Bible says that's exactly what's going to happen. And it's going to happen with drama. With um, a white horse and a king who rides. Whose name is holiness and true. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And he will interject himself into human history and be glorified in it. And leverage and segue this old age into a new age. That's the true story. You see, John, uh, little John I like to call him, is the author of Revelation. He was probably one of the youngest disciples. He grew up with Jesus. And uh, he lived probably longer than all the other disciples. And by the time he gets to the near the end of his life, he has a great vision. He's, on the, he's exiled by the Roman state on an island named Patmos in the Aegean Sea. Slide number 11, if you would please. Slide number 11. And he wanted to connect. And you can see here, uh, well, maybe not so well. But um, there is, should be right in this area here is where the Isle of Patmos was. And you have the seven churches to which the book of Revelation is addressed just in the hinterland there off of the coast. If you go to the next slide, this is kind of a, a zoomed in picture of what the Isle of Patmos looked like. Somewhere on that island, there are limestone-based caves uh, in this island. John was on a, in a cave on a hard bed of stone, exiled by the Roman state for being a political threat to the then government of the era and time in which he lived. And John was given a revelation by God... Uh, he takes these key prophetic Old Testament uh, prophecies and he weaves them together, not in a sterile, boring way, but in a very exciting story form that helps wrap up the story. And it's very intriguing because he pulls together these strands of prophetical thought into this, weaves them into this great, uh, incredible story with these uh, characters that are just over the top that are very descriptive and, and, and these characters uh, based on how he weaves the book and the story and the plot these characters represent some very powerful forces not just individuals but groups of people ideologies governmental uh, relig religious groups uh, it, they represent a lot of different things and John creates a very stunning story with some very stunning characters that have a very stunning plot. There are visions, there are places that are described heavenly and earthly. There are creatures, there are songs, there are cities, there are armies. Uh, they're described by John and they just leave us back reeling on our heels when we realize all that John writes about. 
things that will happen, things that are to come, things that are to come on the earth. There's this earth that quakes, the sky that falls. There's bottomless pits in this book. There's a hemorrhaging, uh, bottomless pits that hemorrhage with smoke. There's a lake of fire There's from which uh, those who enter it will never return. John talked about kings who ride into war. He talked about dem- demonic inspired warriors who have supernatural weapons. And about those who wreak havoc on mankind. And according to John the Revelator, there will be natural catastrophes, supernatural interventions, man-made tragedies. And the planet will rock and reel under the accumulated burden of life in rebellion against God after all of these years. And John talks about a man riding in on a white horse to save the day just in the nick of time. And we ask ourselves, why does God show us all of these things? We are shown this because if we see how things will end, we can turn away from the path or paths that we may be journeying on that are not true expressions of the true story. John shows us this, the the reason that this book is sent to the seven churches of Asia, that they might learn from the judgments of God, that he eventually is going to hold the, quote-unquote, the Babylon philosophy of the world accountable. And John shows us these things, this portrait of a heavenly wedding of the Lamb bridegroom with his church bride, and, and it includes the statement when he talks about uh, the, the world, those who are Christ's followers, who are longing for his appearing. It talks in Revelation chapter nineteen seven about a bride that has made herself ready. And so one of the reasons we have these, uh, these incredible pictures, apocalyptic pictures... And one of the reasons we have these apocalyptic details is so that the true followers of the one true God and of the true story can get herself ready for the big wedding. The wedding shindig that's on the way. And the story motivates us to be loyal to the one true story. And so that's what apocalyptic is. That's why John writes the way he does is he wants you to see how things are going to go such that you will ask yourself the loyalty question. How do I show loyalty to the lion lamb? I see how the story goes. I see what the contours, the plot lines are going to consist of. Now how might I alter my life path such that I'm expressing true loyalty to the one true God? And so, someone has defined loyalty as the ability to put others before yourself. To stick with them through thick and thin and to look out for them. And to be loyal to Christ is important for He has been loyal to us. And so how do we show our loyalty to Christ? We accept His invitation of friendship. In Revelation 3, He writes about knocking at the door. And if we want to let him into our life, that when it comes time to drop the curtain on the, of the, the curtain of curtains on the ages of human time as we know it, that we will be ready for that by embracing him in our life. It's important that we go the extra mile and honor the lion lamb in today's world. And I think it's awesome what we're seeing in the Olympics. God is just using these great Olympian athletes Olympic athletes and, and after their post their, their post medal races or competitions uh, we might just show a few at the end of the service today but um, they are giving glory to God and that's awesome how they're expressing their allegiance to Him on the, one of the greatest platforms of their life I think to honor the lion lamb is to respect his father and honor what his father loved and created and reverence it and and hold it as sacred. I think to be loyal to the lion lamb is to stand up for him in an age in which that's not a popular thing to do at times. is to spend time with him and be dependable to get things done in him and for his name. And so that's one of the reasons why we have apocalyptic is to show you how it's going to go and to cause you to reevaluate your priorities 
so that you can align your life with the winning side. Align your life. Align your priorities. And if you have gotten tangled up in some of the affairs of the quote-unquote the Babylon of the world, the world that lives for the here and now, if you've gotten yourself caught up in that to test those priorities and to begin to wean yourself away from them and to live your life for the agenda and and to express loyalty to the one true king. You know, here's the story I get after reading the book of Revelation. There's a lion lamb. It's Jesus and he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy, he's qualified to accomplish what is written in the ancient scrolls of the book of Revelation. And there's a throne sitter in this book. He's God and there's a heavenly council and they approve of the credentials of the lion lamb and they meet in this heavenly council and he is proved to be worthy. He has the qualifications and the credentials. He's the only one in all the eons of time and pre-time and post-time. He's the only one who is qualified and approved to open the scrolls that bring the final curtain down on human history. There's a lion lamb and he's got followers who are called saints and or city dwellers as they're called later in the book or reference or imply they're city dwellers as opposed to earth dwellers. And Revelation talks about those who dwell on the earth, those who are earth dwellers and and maybe uh, in the series in Revelation you remember me talking about earth dwellers. Uh, It's John's preferred label for referencing a group of people who have barricaded themselves in on this planet in order to keep God out. That's what an earth dweller is. And as this human history rolls on, there will be a barricading uh, in of people in order to keep God and, and Jesus and the religion and Bible and biblical values and Christian worldview to push it out further and further and further. We want to barricade ourselves in such that we view life as we want to view it. And John called those who side with the dragon in this book, those who side with the Antichrist leader in this book, those who side with the anti Christian worldview in this book, he calls them earth dwellers. Why? because they live only for the earth that's what they want they only live for what they can see they only live for what they can possess they only live for the power they can weld or, or the, for, for, for the prestige that they can accumulate and they persist in these beliefs over an entire lifetime on earth and John said that they are mere earth dwellers living only for the now and so when we look at this book as a whole, and as this, the series, the story is being wrapped up, we can say that despite the cycles of judgment that grow more intense on the earth in the book of Revelation, instead of softening their hearts in response to the unspeakable calamity going on in the world, they steadfastly harden their hearts and refuse to change. No matter how bad things get in Revelation, earth dwellers refuse to repent during the unfolding of the cataclysmic events. Inspired by the dragon beast, Satan, and his minions, earth dwellers refuse to give God his place in this great drama, this great story. They live to revolt. Heaven rejoices, and we see the hallelujahs in the book of Revelation, not because uh, people are being damned, but because God is finally receiving the glory he deserves. And earth dwellers can't stand that it's so. Earth dwellers have persisted in their rebellion in this book. They're inspired by the demonic. They refuse to repent. They have witnessed the rapture of the church. They have witnessed the supernatural preservation of lion lamb followers. Uh, They have witnessed the preservation of the Christ followers through all the judgments of Revelation. Earth dwellers have witnessed the seven seals. They've witnessed the four horsemen. They've witnessed the rise of the blasphemous Antichrist. They've witnessed the war, the famine, the collapsing cosmos, the earthquakes, the heavenly disasters, the disease, the plagues, the enormous loss of life, up to 50% of the human population. They have witnessed the 144,000 Jewish evangelists and their message. They have witnessed their supernatural preservation. 
They have witnessed the demonic locust and may have been afflicted by them. They have witnessed the dynamic duo take on the beast and win against him for three and a half years. And they have, they have uh, witnessed this uh, as these uh, Jewish witnesses have shared the love story that God has been trying to tell humanity for centuries. They have witnessed two Jewish witnesses as well. And their resurrection and ascension. They have witnessed countless martyrdoms where lion lamb followers laid down their lives for the lion lamb. They have witnessed the dragon, Satan, pursue with anti-Semitic fervor the people of God. They have watched his kingdom uh, as his kingdom grew out into every aspect of life and controlled the world. They have watched the Antichrist kingdom. They have witnessed the counterfeit trinity manipulate earth dwellers into receiving the mark of the beast. They have witnessed an angel proclaiming the eternal gospel. They have witnessed people being scorched by the sun, enveloped in darkness, pounded with 100 pound hailstones. They have seen the seas turn to blood, Revelation 16. They have witnessed the collapse of the vast kingdom of the Antichrist. They have seen the militias and militaries of the world gather for battle and still they repent not. Their rebellion plays out to the very end. Their decision has been made despite God giving them opportunity after opportunity to know what was coming and to call on Him in loyal followership and to call on His Lion Lamb for salvation. But their hearts remain Pharaoh hard. Love has died. They no longer are responsive to God's sacred romance. To use a phrase by Calvin Miller, the poet. It is a requiem for love. It is a funeral mass for love. And that's all that they can chant. Love has died. You know, in, on slide number five, the text tells us, let us rejoice and be glad. And give Him glory, Revelation 19.7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And His bride has made herself ready. This book, so filled with judgment, is nested. And the story from the very beginning has always been nested in love story. It's really about a wedding in the end. White garments and wedding attire everywhere. And the only way we can come away from being prostitutes on this planet, the only way we can say, uh, transition from prostitutes to being brides, the only way is when we realize that the punishment for our adulteries are wiped away. And we can lie in the arms of our true spouse and drink the cup of joy at the end of time. Because he had to lie on a cross and drink the cup of wrath in the midst of time. So this thing we call the story is really about a love story. And in Revelation 19, 11, on slide number 6, the power of love and the love of power collide. And after these cycles of persistent rebellion, they come to a full expression. Human rebellion comes to a full expression, and I've already expressed the earth-dwelling commitment to rebel and to be successful rebels to the very end. There comes a time when God says, okay, it's time. Um, you know, I've been watching some of the Olympics, and I've mentioned that last couple of weeks. And we're seeing a lot of things. A lot of people are glorifying God. I, I'm not sure what I think about the finger wagging thing. I don't know, maybe you saw that. And it, where the finger, the one gal was finger wagging the Russian swimmer that was supposedly maybe doping, and of course sports is losing all meaning because you know you're going to have a, a, the the doping thing is changing everything, and so you really don't know what you're competing against. 
But the finger wagging thing, I guess it really depends on who's wagging the finger, doesn't it? I think it, what I think of is back when several years ago when Jordan came into the lane was going to dunk on Matumbo's head and Matumbo jumped up and rejected him and then he, would, he did one of these. Remember that? Some of you NBA fans? He does one of these. A couple of games later, Jordan dunked on his head. He finally got him and then Jordan looked at him and did one of these. Okay, he wagged a finger back. Well, we can wag our finger. I don't know any of us have really a right to wag our finger at anybody. Uh, yeah, doping's not a good deal, but I don't know if I'd be wagging my finger because chances are in all our lives, there's something you can look at your life and you can wag the finger and find some shame in it somewhere. But I find consolation. I have to be honest. When the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords steps into human history and he looks it over at the kingdom of darkness and the beast and the dragon and the false prophet and the earth dwellers who have relished the execution of lion lamb followers till the blood runs deep. I find great joy and delight not For the violence necessarily. But for one who steps into history and he says no more. No, no, no. You don't dunk on people's heads here anymore. Doping is not allowed here. This is going to be made right. And unless you understand all that I've said previous, you're going to come away from Revelation 19, 11 through 20, these verses, and you're going to say, oh, just how horrible it is that... Jesus has a violent side. It's hogwash. Don't waste your time with that kind of thought. Human rebellion has risen up. It has has erupted in major waves of eruption in this book. And as human history comes to a close. And there is a a lion, lamb, who in, uh, on slide 6, Revelation 19, 11, I saw, John says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. The king is coming back to deal with the usurper and tell him no more. And this this unholy trinity, this dragon who has been after his people Israel and after his bride, the church, they will now be directly attacked in a direct frontal assault. Evil men and powers sometimes make war necessary and earth dwellers who align with with the agenda of the beast have aligned themselves against the great One who comes back and says no more. But he tells us about it. So we can change. Isn't that wonderful? He lets us know. There's no surprises. How's it going to go? Align your loyalties with the right side. And do it today. The white horse is significant in the passage. It's customary for a triumphant Roman general to to parade on the main thoroughfare of Rome when he comes back after his military conquest and his campaigns and he would return and Rome would go crazy as, as they watch these wagon loads of, of, of valuable, highly valuable things, captives and treasures and exotic animals trailing behind the Roman general on a white horse as he, trump, as he trots into the main thoroughfare of Rome. And John understands this and perhaps he has seen this and the, and the crowd would go nuts over this and it was pandemonium. And that's the picture that John has in mind when he begins to present Christ as the mighty victor who is now returning from the spoils of war and his voluntary captives, not subjugated by, by, uh, by an iron fist, but, but, but by those who love him. They're there because they want to be. Those who have been loyal and faithful to him, they follow him. 
and they love Him and they want to be His servants. John says in, jo- in Revelation 19, 12, His eyes, slide number 6, His eyes are like blazing fire. He can see right through you. There's nothing that escapes His notice. His eyes pierce through and see everything. He knows who's an earth dweller. He knows who's a true lion lamb followers. He knows how to judge rightly and to judge rightly you have to have this kind of flaming vision of, of, of uh, righteous omniscience and he has it. And on his head are many crowns. He has royal rank. Regal authority. And it's the idea that he's just, he's collected all the crowns that there are to be collected. All the gold medals that there are to be ha- hanged on a neck. And they're all on his head. These crowns are on his head. And, and because nobody, nobody else is qualified to rule like he's qualified. He, he here is the ultimate symbol of sovereignty John presents to us. It's, it's all the crowns on a single head. He has complete right to rule. And in contrast to the beast that has ten crowns on ten heads in Revelation 13.1. And, and the dragon that has seven crowns on his heads in Revelation 12.3. We have all the crowns on a single head. He returns to take the earth back, to abolish a false world religion, to implement a new economy, to rule over what is rightfully His. He has a name written on Him that no one knows but He Himself. His name was unintelligible to John. It's like a secret name. I think there's going to be things about Jesus that we learn and we keep on learning. Things about His nature. Things about His essence. Things about His sovereignty. Things about His incarnation, pre-incarnation, post-incarnation. We're going to learn lots and lots and lots and keep on learning. Exploring the and plummeting the depths of who He is and what He was and how He represented it and how He accomplished the plan from the eons of time and why He is so worthy. It's a name that humans cannot see right now. We can't understand it. Verse 13, he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. And you're thinking, now wait a second, he's coming with a blood spattered garment. But the battle hasn't started, Pastor. Where did the blood come from? And may I hasten to remind you this morning, this is not his first battle, you know. It's not his first battle. This is his last battle. He has worn his battle clothes before. Who but he has fought the dragon? Who but he, the pre-incarnate angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, fighting for Israel in the days of Joshua and Judges? His garments have been splattered with blood for a long time. And who but he battled Pharaoh and the triumph of the Exodus? It's the almighty conqueror who has his war clothes on here and his war clothes bear the stains of prior battles and this is not his first battle it's the almighty conqueror who battled with sin at the cross and mingled his own blood with the blood of his enemies on his battle clothes and now these battles are to be these clothes battle clothes are to be stained again Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him riding on a white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. That's the bride. Verse 15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. His destiny will be to overpower all hostile powers. His destiny to rule all the nations, to oppose the beast and the armies. And they will see the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and they will unite to oppose Christ. And but he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. It's a very vivid symbol of judgment. Verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God. 
And you know what's really crazy is the, bird under, the birds understand it. Instead of a funeral, it's a supper. And it's known as Feast of the Birds. And supper here is the same word that's used to describe the marriage supper of verse 9. It refers to the principal meal of the day. But the menu is definitely different here. Many vultures, many birds will be gathered by God to the site of the battle. And it's God's cleanup crew. And you have a tale of two suppers in Revelation. Revelation 19 is the first supper, is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's the one you want to be a part of. Lasts about a thousand years. And it's the main topic of the first half of Revelation. Of 19, Revelation 19. And the latter part of Revelation 19 is a nasty supper. It's a supper that will turn your stomach. You know, I found it intriguing this week. As I, if you look on slide number 13, it's just a little side note here. All the birds from Western Europe, all the migratory birds, which are the larger birds, they migrate through Israel. Did you know that? This little land bridge. You go to slide number 13 for me. Slide number 13. All these great migratory uh, birds, they will migrate, you know, some of the other places, but primarily through Israel. And you can see it right there. Um, Right there is Israel. And here's your continent, and here's your continent down here. And they'll migrate in the springtime of the year down through. And then they'll migrate back through. It's kind of intriguing, isn't it? This great migration. They need food. And so they, if you go further to the west, you've got water. Further to the east, you've got desert. They migrate through Israel. It's kind of intriguing. And, uh, and plus there's these thermal currents that they can kind of glide on. And uh, millions and millions and millions of birds all flying through Israel. Isn't that amazing? When you read something like this in the book of Revelation, John's Revelation. Will you allow me to use my God-given imagination for a moment? I have always felt the thought of an inanimate object talking or an animal talking like a human would talk. I've always found that to be fascinating. And I think it's fascinating here that these birds understand the words as it were in John's revelation and the idea of a talking animal uh, just just like the talking eagle in Revelation 8 we read about or uh, and C.S. Lewis I think was the one that was fond of this idea and uh, he was he he helps us to imagine what it's like and what it potentially could be like if we and we're all meant to rule and to reign that was God's plan from the beginning not over each other but the animal kingdom, we were all meant to rule and reign in the world. And he helps us see this. And he, he has us uh, interacting in some of his stories with beavers and dogs and lions and eagles. And imagine trees coming to life and holding you in their branches while they walk you to your destination in this new age that's to come. Imagine a planet that assumes spatial properties and interacts with you. They will report into you and you will know them personally. Imagine the serpent that talked in Eden, you know, and that's, that's maybe a, a little hint at maybe what is to come. Or Balaam's donkey that talked, or the eagle that talks again in Revelation 8, or the, uh, an earth that opens its mouth in Revelation 12 and swallows the venom that was meant to kill the lady in the book. Imagine the animal kingdom assembling around you on your God-appointed throne, and you get to rule over them in eternity. Imagine that. You have eagles t- taking you for a flight overhead, elephants doing your bidding, birds singing songs to you throughout the day, horses that gallop through meadows with you perched on their back. You're a son of Adam, you're a daughter of Eve, and God meant for you to reign under his lead. That's powerful. The mind has not conceived nor the heart really dreamt of all the things the Lord has in store. For when the, the time, when time is no more. Well, verse 18 tells us, So that you may eat the flesh of kings. These birds are called in. These birds that normally will fly through this land bridge called Israel. These birds will be called in and summons at just the right moment. 
perhaps the spring of the year, they'll be called in that they may eat the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. And so the they eat the flesh of kings. They start at the top. And it's a terrible indignity for any king or anyone to lie unburied and for birds to tear into their flesh. But that's precisely what's going to happen as human, the, the, the curtain falls on a rebellious human history. There's no respecter of persons or honor burials for those who align themselves with the beast. Earth dwellers, it's a scene of disgrace and destruction for the pride filled. Even the horses are not exempt in all classes of earth dwelling society, from kings and generals down to horses and riders, free and slave, small and great, all the social status. The birds will clean up the mess. Earth dwellers and the mark of the beast recipients will be slain by a single word. By the sword that goes out of the mouth of the conquering one. And time will be no more as we know it. But even so, what is astounding is that earth dwellers, even though they know this now, even though I'm preaching it now, I'm saying it now, even though this is a story, this has been circulating here and there in little local believer enclaves throughout the world, earth dwellers refuse to partake of the marriage supper of the Lamb. I'd rather be supper to some bird than sit at the table with the lion lamb and let him rule and reign. Notice the emphasis on the word flesh in verse 18. It says it twice. The flesh of kings, the flesh of all people. Earth dwellers have been all about living for the flesh. The human body, we crave each other's bodies. There's the sexual immoral. There's the gratifying of our hungers with each other. There's satisfying our cravings. We have, we have lost the meaning of the true love story. And simply we feed on flesh today. It's not about romance anymore. We consume each other. We use each other. We abuse each other. And we discard when we're done. And now the great irony is that they themselves, the earth dwellers, flesh and all, will be consumed. It's the great irony of this book. The birds will pick their body piece by piece. And those earth dwellers that reduced human beings to a series of body parts to be exploited will now have their body parts exploited and consumed in a great ironic twist to the great narrative of our time. Verse 19. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. Now John jumps from an implied battle scene to the moment when the lion lamb finally gets to the head haunches of the revolt. He says, but the beast, the Antichrist, was captured. And I'm thinking, wait a second, he skipped the battle. I'm ready for the battle. And he just skips it. Here's the, we're ready for the battle, but the beast was captured. What's going on with that? Talk about anticlimax. What's the deal? You know why? I don't think there is much of a battle. He speaks a word and everything that can be made known is made known. All that needs to be revealed is revealed. All those who are in the earth dwelling camp with loyalties to the beast, the false prophet, antichrist leaders, they're immediately revealed. And life, their lives are checked. And they have been weighed and found wanting by the great judgment of the lion lamb. It's not much of a battle. It's not a relishing of bloodshed we see. It's a spoken word. Boom. Be revealed. Poof. It happens. And with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. Their demonic powers will no longer be enough. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. 
the two of them were thrown. They're getting roughed up some. They're not just gently, oh, here you go, open the door, there you go. Be nice and gentle with them. No, no, they have manipulated, they have molested, they have destroyed lion lamb followers for many, many uh, periods of time. They have been behind the great deception that's ripped marriages apart, that's torn friendships apart, that's addicted people, that has uh, caused people to give their loyalties to things, lesser, lesser, lesser things. And finally he stands and he says, no more. And they throw them alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. I could talk a little bit about that, but we're moving on. Verse 21, the rest of them, those aligned with the beast, were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Ironic twist. Isn't it ironic that we're talking about this on the, on the day we have a picnic? Well, you guys are going to be like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for barbecue beef or not. <laughs> Actually, this thing resolves well. But the entire battle, you've got to hear this. I've got to be faithful to proclaim it. Why? Because I want you to check your loyalty. Who have you aligned with? What? You know, what? Okay. Values? Maybe I need to adjust some things. Because I want to make sure I'm loyal to the right winner. And the he who is king of kings and lord of lords. That's why we have apocalyptic. That's why I go back to my earlier statement. If I can convince you to align yourself with the lion lamb now. You're going to love the finish. And the entire Bible, though, when we look at this, is really a great story of sacred romance. It's got adventure in it. It's got battle in it. It's really an intense love story between God and His creation. But with the villain who's looking to destroy this relationship. And the Bible begins with the creation of all things. It plunges into evil. We looked at that in the story. We talked about blood covenants and God's plan to redeem a world. And this, this fall in human history though meanders through uh, eras of time. And eventually the story tells us of one who disguised himself in order to win the love of a girl. That's the story. And by the time we get to the end, we have a king on a white horse who rides in to rescue the girl just in the nick of time. He conquers Satan and all evil by dying on a cross. He resurrects from the dead. He gets the bride, the body of uh, the bride of Christ, and they live happily ever after in a new city with a garden in a palace decorated with jewels, and he eliminates the one who's trying to kill the bride. So she's safe forever. What is there not to love about that story? And why is that story not being heralded forth in our world? You see, written on your heart is a longing for happily ever after. There is a desire in you for a sacred romance. Every time you pull the tissue out and you wipe in your eyes, when you see Matthew McConaughey and whoever in a you know, great romantic drama... That's a little pointer that says, hey, 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 it's going to be that way someday. Your dreams are going to come true. And that's the story of the Bible. You see, things were once good for all of us. Unbroken romance in Eden's garden, but Satan the villain has sabotaged our stories. And we bought in, and yet God writes the person of Jesus into our story miraculously. And he begins to restore the world that God made through him. And in Jesus, he hangs on to this original fallen creation, and he begins to work to salvage and redeem it. He wants to make us participating characters in his story, and Jesus is the way you go about doing it. Would you like to be an active participant in the story? God has romanced you with the love of a suitor. And he laid down and died for you. So you'd say yes to his overtures of love. 
He's always been at work trying to romance and win your hearts. But He wants you to love Him not because you have to, not because you're forced to, not even because of how things are going to resolve in the end. Though that's part of it. He wants you to love Him not out of robotic obedience, but because of passionate engagement. And even though sin has touched every part of our world and reached all of our hearts, God enables us to say yes to His love. I like what Henry Nouwen says, The unfathomable mystery of God is that God is a lover who wants to be loved, says Nouwen. The one who created us is waiting for our response. God not only says, You are my beloved, God also asks, Do you love me and he offers us countless chances to say yes the thrill band would you come band would you come the thrill of choosing is yours will it be the dragon or the lion lamb God made you free to choose and even to destroy, but it was a risk He was willing to take so that you might love freely. We love watching films, don't we? In which a band of friends find deeper connections through the challenges thrown at them by an external threat. Precisely because we desire that same connection with our own friends and family. I think that's why we like those kinds of films. And I think this whole ordeal called the story has enlarged us. It has sparked our imagination. It has explained some things from the Old Testament. It has oriented us to the plot of human history. It gives a grand sense of purpose to life and living. It underscores why we meet every week to shore up our loyalties to the lion lamb. And that if we live out aspects of the story... That can transform the world through loving truth dedica- into a truth loving dedicated place. And so when we make journeys like this together, it does something. It shows big picture things. It reveals a plan hidden from ordinary sight. It builds community. It, it, it guides a community that have been hardened by life's battles, that have been softened by true and genuine partnership have been forged by a shared vision for a better world. That's what the series will do. It has done. The kind of intimacy that I'm talking about is found in the third installment of Peter Jackson's epic Lord of the Rings film trilogy. And maybe you're familiar with that. In The Return of the Kings, you got Frodo and Sam and They finally destroyed the ring and Mordor has been defeated and there's four hobbits. And they return to normal life in Sleepy Hobbiton. And they find themselves at a large wooden table and it's a noisy, bustling inn and and there are other uh, drinkers that are laughing and carousing and they're going on with life as they always had known it. But Frodo and his friends have experienced something. It's an adventure like no other. And they, and they look death in the face many times. And, and by rallying together, they, they not only survive, but they triumphed over evil. And, and what of this experience could their friends and neighbors possibly understand? And as they raise their tankards of ale to their lips, they look at each other, a long, knowing look. And they hold their gaze with their friends. They know each other. No words can express what they're thinking, but they know each other's thoughts. And that's kind of how it's going to be. And that's kind of how it is with you and me. Someday, in a marriage feast, you're going to catch my eye, and I'm going to catch yours. And you're going to look at me, and instead of doing this, you're going to say, come here. I'm going to say, what's up? Thanks for telling me about it. Thanks for telling the whole story every week. 
Thank you for being real with the truth, for preserving it, for not letting the world sabotage the story of stories, the story of the ages. Thank you. And as a result, I got my life in order. And I got my loyalty straight. And I placed my allegiance in the one in whom history resolves. Incredible. And we're going to live for that day. And so this morning, at the end of chapter 31, the end of time, I want to extend to you the opportunity, if you haven't done so in your life, to express your loyalty to the true King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And you'd like to express that. You know, I sometimes when people say every head bow and eyes closed, if you want to accept Jesus, raise your hand. I don't know about that. It wasn't shut your eyes so nobody could see. No, no. If you're ready, who cares who sees you? Who cares? This morning, I don't care who's here. If in your heart, you have never heard this story, maybe. You've never heard how history resolves. In your heart, you want to be a servant of the one true king. You just come out right where you are. You get stand right here in the front while the band sings. And as they finish up, then I'm going to pray with you. And we're going to dismiss you. And we're going to go eat some barbecue beef or pork. A barbecue pork and some potato salad and some green beans and whatever else you guys have brought. We're going to have fun. We're going to celebrate. But I don't know of a better way to get this thing started than for some who say, the lion lamb is my savior. You do that today as we sing. Let's pray. Dear God, you are a cornerstone, awesome and mighty. God, we stand firm on you and with you. And God, what an awesome privilege that we may come before your throne clothed in the righteousness of Christ, washed in that precious blood, spilt on our behalf. God, we praise you. You are the Lion Lamb, the Alpha and Omega. We just acknowledge you, God. In Christ's name, we pray these things. Lord, we also pray for our upcoming, our lunch here. I pray that you may bless the hands that prepared it. Bless that food to our bodies and may it nourish and sustain us, God. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you again for all those who made this series what it was and is and has been. And so we're so glad you came and journeyed with us. Blessings to you. Thank you for all the hands that prepared the food and the setup and things out here um, on the church. This is, uh, churches used to call this dinner on the grounds. Okay, it's dinner on the grounds day. So I hope uh, you can respond by just staying a few minutes, grabbing some food, enjoying the fellowship and things. And just remember that someday, show that picture real quick for me, guys. The marriage Supper of the Lamb, the, the picture with the plate and the long table. I want you to have this picture in your minds as you sit down and eat together today. And we'll pull that up real quick. Um, it's the marriage Supper of the Lamb. It's a table that just goes on forever and ever and ever. And it's an unending feast. And, um, and um, I don't know what else I can say until it gets there. But that, there it is. See that picture right there? That's you and me. That's you and me someday. And you be there and don't be late. Supper is being served. And that's a place there with your name on it. You have a great day. See you in a few minutes.